Hello, I'm Kate Weller, curator of the Schenectady County Historical Society. Thank you for joining us in our first in a series of podcasts on Schenectady County history. Today, Nancy Curran, board member of the Schenectady County Historical Society, will interview author Bill Buell on his upcoming book, Historic Schenectady County, a Bicentennial History. Please join us on November 5th from 6 to 9 p.m. for a reception and book signing by Bill. For more information, check out our website at www.schist.org. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nancy Curran. I'm a trustee of the Schenectady Historical Society, and I'm also a genealogist, which makes me a historian. So I'm really pleased to talk today with Bill Buell, who is the author of Historic Schenectady County, a Bicentennial History. Bill, uh, how did you decide to even write the book? Uh, well, way back two years ago now, um, I've been volunteering here on Saturday mornings for about four years. And two years ago, Ed Riley approached me and said how they had been contacted by this national publishing company uh, to see if they wanted to produce a book about historic Schenectady County. Okay. And asked me if I would be interested in writing it, and I was, and that's how it got started. How are you familiar with Schenectady County? How do you know what you're writing about? Well, I thought I knew a lot about history, but I <laughs> found out I didn't know that much. Uh, I started volunteering here and you, you just pick up a lot of stuff that uh, you just weren't aware of. I didn't know we had a socialist mayor. Oh, uh, you didn't know about the socialist mayor? I did mayor. not know about the socialist mayor. I didn't appreciate how much connected he had to obey the whims of Albany back in the 17th century. Because it was part of Albany County. Right. I didn't know about Christopher Yates and Joseph Yates. And um, so volunteering here for four years has just given me a wealth of information which really helped me uh, get started on the book. And when you wrote the book, I would think, as someone who used to be a reporter, I've read and heard people say, gee, journalists are sprinters, they're not marathoners. Did you find it a challenge to plan such a long project? Yes, I can say that. Um, I spent uh, Saturday mornings here, if I wasn't too busy, I'd be in the library doing research. Um, I spent almost every Sunday from uh, December to the following November working on the book. Not every Sunday, but that was my schedule. Uh, I'd spend three or four, sometimes five or even six hours on Sunday uh, actually working on the book, writing it, researching it and I didn't do that much during the week. Um, obviously, as things got closer to my deadline, uh, <laughs> I required to do a little bit more work, and I did do some work on weeknights. Uh, but mostly, I was, I was pretty disciplined and did a lot of it on my Sundays. Then you learned a lot about yourself, too. That uh -huh. You actually yes. could plan a long project. Many of us have a book in mind, and it's hard to break it into doable segments. Yeah, I found that I would just sit down on a Sunday morning and, and have to stare at my stuff for an hour before my mind was in a place where I could actually start working on it. <laughs> so you spend an hour there just sitting looking at everything you have and then hopefully you spend the, the next two or three hours being productive. Well, they'll throw in an old chestnut that type is type and writers look out windows. Okay. So then when you sat down to type, all of your looking out the window came right out your fingers. Do you write, I'm assuming you wrote, write on a software word processing program? Yeah, a laptop computer, right? And I'm sure that you went from... I don't even know what a typewriter is anymore, I've forgotten. Well, come to my house, I have three or four okay. <laughs> that are gathering dust. Mm -hmm. Do you think it makes you a better writer working on a word processor? Um, uh, the old way seems so laborious to me, I can't imagine people actually sitting down and writing out a whole book on, in longhand, oh, and, that is... or even doing it on an old typewriter, it just boggles my mind. I can't imagine mm. how they used to do that back then. Yes, I kept, I kept up with the curve as soon as, as, soon as PCs were available. Mm -hmm. I had a Commodore 64. That's a long Good time ago. Now, as you were, you're talking about people doing things in what we think of as archaic, even yay, barbaric ways of writing. Was there anybody in, in all of your studies that surprised you? Um, I really liked uh, Christopher Yates a lot. Um, 
I just thought uh, he seemed like a wonderful guy. What um, was wonderful about him? There are uh, testaments to him from other people from that time period saying what a likable, affable gentleman he was and what a true patriot. Do you and know roughly when he lived? Can you quote the date? 1743 to no, 1730 something to 1783. He was wounded at the Battle of uh, either Lake George or Niagara. He was there, both of them, during the mm -hmm. French and Indian War. And eventually he died in his 50s because of those wounds. Oh, really? Yeah. Which even then was a, a fairly decent lifespan mm -hmm. right. on a statistical average. And I also liked his son, Joseph Yates. Um, Did Joseph Yates live at 32 Front Street? Do you know that? He Where lived at 17 Front Street. Okay, um, so he was up the He street. may have been born at, on 32 Front Street. I'm not sure exactly uh, the details right now sitting here, but... Okay, I know the Schenectady uh, Community Archaeology Program has been digging this right. past summer at 32 Front, and I wondered whether our conversation had unwittingly led us into another connection. <laughs> I think he might have been born somewhere around there, but his the house he lived in while he was governor is... Uh, right uh, on the corner of Governor's Lane and Front Street, which I think Hence is... Hence the name Governor's Lane? Yes. Oh, never right. occurred to me. Mm -hmm. And so he was a governor of New York State. He's the only Schenectady native to become governor of New York. Really? Mm -hmm. May it happen again. <laughs> uh, I, f I find that reading, reading the census records and the church records and the cemetery records here in the historical society just fleshes out the bones of the story that you're telling so much. And you're so well known for your interviewing that I wonder whether it was frustrating to you not to be able to call someone up and say, <laughs> uh, hey, I really wanted to talk to you about something. Could I come over to your estate or meet you in your law office or mm -hmm. the governor's, wherever the governor was living at the time? Did you find that you wanted to talk to people in person? Uh, well, it would have been a great opportunity. Um, I talked to Maxine Lund, who was um, George Lund's daughter. -in -law. And that's the socialist governor. The so uh, mayor. Mayor. Uh, mayor that's sorry. And she told me how he was just a wonderful man, and she would go over to the house for dinner on Sunday nights, and they would have just a wonderful, sparkling uh, conversation over dinner. Um, so it would have been great to be able to sit down and talk to somebody like him or Christopher Yates. Mm. But I haven't invented my time machine yet, so that's not a possibility. Well, now the book is done. I hope you're working on the time machine. Yes. Uh, do you have a science background or a history background? Um, I have a history degree from the University at Albany. Okay. Uh, science, no. Then how did you make the? How did you get into a journalism career with a history degree? Um, well, I, I started my journalism career long before I had my history degree. I know your father was a journalist. My father was an uh, assistant sports editor and a sports writer for the Union Star and the uh, Daily Gazette. And that's basically how I got started. And then after I had that job, I continued to go to school and finally got my degree from U were Albany. You, were you a copy boy? Um, I used to answer the phone a lot when I was young. <laughs> And I started working for the Gazette as a paper boy when I was 11, so... You're a capitalist. Yeah, I go way back. The Gazette and I go way back. I guess you do. I, I also worked for the Gazette, mm -hmm. working in the city room. And for people who think that they know everything that's published, the excitement, I think, of being in the news is that you know things before they're published. Mm -hmm. And you hear the conversation, just as you said, you are a host here at the Historical Society and you pick up stray things and when you're a, a new reporter in the city room you're picking up stuff all the time, all the background information which eventually, I really believe everything you do gets applied later on in your next career. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you thought about what you might do based on a journal, journalism career? Have you do, do you do any teaching for example? I don't do any teaching but that would be fun. I, I always, I, always thought that I wanted to teach, but I enjoy writing so much that I never really pursued that. Well, that's close. Yeah. I do want to write another book, um, 
It would probably be focused on George Lunn and the year 1912. 1912. I think that was. I think it was under his mayoral tenure that they first bought automobiles for Schenectady officials. Oh yeah, that. I sounds, think it was about that right. modern time. But he also created uh, new schools in uh, Central Park with Charles Steinmetz on the school board, um, and he was just a very uh, another very likable guy. I never really came across anything uh, about him that I didn't like. And very forward thinking, obviously. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so he changed, he really changed a lot about Schenectady. I knew that Charles Steinmetz was on the Board of Education, which just boggles my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, looking back, I know the Schenectady schools had, the schools had their own radio station in the schools. They taught a lot of foreign languages. They introduced the technical electrical and technical mechanical program that was very hard to get into, barred to girls, that it prepared you to be an apprentice at GE. Mm -hmm. So they worked very closely and very logically with the major industries. What, in, what industries in Schenectady did you study? Um, well, the two obvious ones are, of course, General Electric and uh, the American Locomotive Company. Uh, the General Electric history is, is very fascinating. Thomas Edison was willing to spend $3,800, but the, the guy with the land, I forget his name now, but he wanted 4500 This is in 1886, okay. when Edison is trying to find another factory for his uh, Edison electrical works. Uh, Colonel Robert Furman and a bunch of other prominent Connectadians uh, raised the $3,800 difference and gave it to Edison to make sure that he would come to Schenectady and then... Uh, Those were private citizens? It wasn't right. a government tax no, forgiveness private, program? private citizens. So uh, what happened was that Edison did come to Schenectady and in 1894 he merged with another company and that's how we formed General Electric. So it became General instead of Edison. Right. Um, and Alco was Probably even more interesting because, uh, you know, the birth of the railroad uh, kind of started in Schenectady and a few other places throughout the country too, but we were very close to the being first mm -hmm. uh, with the DeWitt Clinton, the steam locomotive, uh, in 1831. Was it that early? Yep, it was, 1831. Um, and uh, uh, the American Locomotive Company, it was originally this Schenectady Locomotive Works, and then they merged with six or seven other companies in 1901, I oh, want to say. Really? And that's what formed the uh, American Locomotive American Company. American instead of Schenectady. Very interesting. Uh, and speaking of transportation, did you do any intense study about Clinton's Ditch, the Erie Canal? Yep. Uh, the Erie Canal is fascinating and fascinating as well. Uh, a lot of very important and smart individuals thought it would be a waste of time, like Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> James Madison, Martin Van Buren. Oh no, no! They all thought this is it's either a bad idea or it was way ahead of its time and it wasn't going to work. And it looked like that, that was going to be the case for a while. Um, but eventually things got going and it became you know, one of the best things American taxpayer money ever did, probably. I'm amazed that there were so many highly placed naysayers. Mm -hmm. Somewhere I read about the difference that it made in the cost of transportation for manufacturers and farmers and passengers. But there was uh, a much smaller cost to ship your goods. Right. And of course it connected Schenectady and other places. Is Waterford the beginning? Uh, Waterford was the beginning of the canal, uh, right down there next to Albany. Um, but the interesting thing about Schenectady is that there are so many locks between Waterford and Schenectady. A lot of the merchants would uh, get their freight from Albany to Schenectady by stagecoach instead oh. of taking the long time all to go locks. through all the canals. So Schenectady was actually, in some ways, a starting point for much of the freight that moved uh, across uh, the Mohawk River and into the Mohawk Valley. At the Rensselaer's Bike Seminar a couple of weeks ago, um, I heard about Schenectady as the gateway to the west and the people from the south would ship their goods north mm -hmm. so they could go th over the Erie Canal and before the Erie Canal just get through the mountains. So it's such an important place in history and I'm so glad that you're the person who wrote the story. Thank you. It was a lot of fun and very interesting and I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more about Schenectady's history.
And we'll talk again when your next book is planned. Okay. We've been talking with Bill Buell, who is a feature writer at the Daily Gazette, published in Schenectady and covering the Capital District. Bill is a longtime Schenectadian, as you gathered from our conversation, and his book is going to be so interesting for you to read because it's a journalist's and historian's point of view about the city in which I live and in which we are so interested here at the Historical Society. Bill is going to have a book signing and reception at the Historical Society, 32 Washington Avenue, November 5th from 6 to 9. And if you'd like to know more about it, here's our website address, www.schist.org. Hope to see you there.